Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. It is Monday and we are still held hostage by our sulking president. Uh, we're joined by Daniel Dresner, who's a professor at the Fletcher School, a uh, contributor to the Washington Post, and author of, this seems so timely, of course, the author of The Toddler in Chief. Daniel, thanks for coming back. I appreciate it. Happy to be here. So the, 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 the toddler motif just doesn't get old. Because it and but here's here's the question. So are we watching this this slow motion coup or just a tantrum by a an emotional three year old with the president right now? I mean, is he Nora Desmond or is he is is the kid at kindergarten who's just pitching a fit? He's the kid at kindergarten who's just pitching a fit. Unfortunately, he's also the commander in chief, which means he occasionally does things that if you were trying to evaluate a normal president, you would find actually legitimately disconcerting. Um, but in Trump's case, basically the way to explain his behavior for most of this month is that he's decompensating. Um, he's trying to cope with a loss that he clearly didn't expect. Um, and furthermore, if you think about it even just a little bit, you realize that this election was not so much a rebuke of the GOP as it turns out. It was right. a specific rebuke of Trump. Um, and I think that, you know, he's probably smart enough to know that, um, but immature enough to to will it out of his brain to sort of engage in in denial. You know, it, it just feel like we're, we're going through this this stress test. The, the let, let's push everything to the absolute extreme. I and mean, we've had this uh, four year stress test of our of our sanity. And Donald Trump, of course, has already broken down all fact checking efforts to deal with his lies. But. You would always think in the back of your mind that there, at some point there would be this massive reality check and a reality check that nobody could ignore. And we right now have two really big ones, obviously, the raging pandemic and a lost election. And he's defying both of them. And that's what makes this so extraordinary is it's one thing for him to be you know, a, a toddler having a tantrum, uh, but doing it in the midst of a national emergency with a quarter million Americans who are are dead and maybe, you know, hundreds of thousands of more if this vaccine. And by the way, we have good news on the vaccine. But if the mm -hmm. vaccine doesn't isn't widely di distributed. And, and so that's what's really remarkable about it. I mean, look, you've been writing about this. I've been talking about this for years. This does seem even more dystopian than our expectations. Do you feel the same way or is this exactly what you thought he would how he would behave? Honestly, this was pretty much exactly how I thought he was going to behave. Um, I mean, I know his pundits were supposed to say that, but like, let me put it this way. As the curator of the, the Toddler in Chief thread, I have never been busier than this past month. And right. it's gotten worse over time. Um, you know, I keep counts by quarter of how many additions I add. And this year, he, he's gotten progressively worse. His, the third quarter was the, the most frequent on record. He's set in the fourth quarter to blow well past that. Um, and so in that sense... He's reacting the way I, I was it was expecting him to. I would push back a little bit on the notion that he hasn't been able to or like, you know, that 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 the the hard realities haven't hit him. There are ways in which he's actually more constrained now than you hmm. might have expected. OK, give me an example of that. What do you mean? So I just take Twitter, for example, where, you know, the la I think twice in the last 12 hours, he's tweeted, I won the election. Right. The yeah, first time right. in all caps, the second time, you know, showing that he's calmed down in, in not all caps. And in both times, you read the tweet and immediately Twitter has put on it, you know, the, the disclaimer officials have called this election result differently. They wouldn't have done that even a year ago, I don't think. Um, and by the way, the, the, I think we have to be prepared for the, the obvious fact that, that in all likelihood, after he ceases to be president, it would not surprise me if by February 1st, Trump is kicked off Twitter um, because he's been afforded certain uh, uh, accommodations because he's a head of state. I think once he ceases to be the head of state and he continues to lie, he's going to get kicked off. Well, his whole world changes when he ceases to be president, which I'm sure is, is another one of those reality checks, realizing that these debts are coming due. Exactly. Uh, his criminal immunity disappears. Uh, all, all kinds of things are going to be coming his way. And especially going out the way he is, it certainly doesn't lower the percentage chances that those things are going to happen. Right. And the other way to think about this is that I, while I understand that, that some of the moves that he's made over the last, you know, since the election um, and a little bit before it have been disconcerting, the primary thing to remember about Trump is that, and I, I, this is a fallacy that political scientists have, have engaged in, that pundits have engaged in, that even reporters have engaged in, which assumes that if Trump does something, there must be some strategic plan yeah. underlying it. 
Um, and, you know, I think Anthony Scaramucci was quoted saying this in the Washington Post over the weekend, but that anyone who thinks he's playing four dimensional chess is wrong. He's mm -hmm. just in the pieces. Um, and so in some ways, we're weirdly lucky that because Trump, um, you know, has a short attention span because he has poor impulse control, all these sort of traditional immature traits, he couldn't plan in advance for the contingency where he lost the election and he lost the election by a sufficient amount that sort of legal monkey business was not going to reverse the, the result. So you now have a situation where like even his supporters, you know, think what Jim Abbott, uh, sorry, not Jim Abbott, uh, the, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his name, the Lieutenant Governor of Texas. Oh, uh, Dan Patrick. Dan Patrick, thanks you. Uh, Dan Patrick said, you know, oh, I think it, on to Maria Bartiromo suggesting, now if we get, you know, the recounts overturned, Georgia and Arizona, then we can take Pennsylvania and put it to the <laughs> Supreme Court and it'll be overturned. You know, which if you, parse that out is insane. It is. And it also, by the way, highlights, I think, in some ways, the one thing I didn't quite expect. I mean, I, I, you should have in retrospect, but I think this is legitimately surprising, which is not that Trump is behaving like this. That was predictable. What is disturbing is the degree to which the institutional wing of the GOP has completely backed his play, by and large. Um, well, I, I agree. I mean, that that has been the story. I mean, Donald Trump is Donald Trump. I mean, mm -hmm. so what we have is this is why your 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 toddler um, image is so appropriate. It's it's like they're the, the the GOP is stepping back and going, okay, we have to give him time to deal with his feelings. He's he's going to deal with this in this immature way, and we we have to let him work it out. And in the meantime, we're not going to ascertain the fact that Joe Biden's the president. We're right. we're not going to say anything. It's it's they they're all like sort of huddled at the door, saying, "Is is he still throwing his food up against the wall?" Right? I mean, and yeah. and 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 I'm just wondering at what point they're going to be willing to step in and say, "Okay, uh, Donald, uh, you know, you got to clean this up." Uh, you got to go. You have to understand that uh, you, in fact, lost this. I think it's it, with, you know, as time goes on, it's not getting any easier for them. Right. And this is the this is the part where, again, I this, this demonstrates the degree to which Trump hasn't really thought out the end game. But more disturbingly, that most of the GOP hasn't thought out the end game, because at some point, um, one of two things has to happen. Right. Either Trump has to in the most truculent way possible, but nonetheless still acknowledge that he lost. Um, not counting what happened yesterday, which, by the way, was friggin' hysterical, but that's a separate conversation um, where he accidentally, you know, yeah. said Biden won well, on Twitter. Yeah. He he won, but only because. Oh no, I didn't mean to say he won. Yeah, I, I have to admit that that entire. I, I want to talk about that cycle because I did find it very amusing. But so one possibility is that he decides, you know, he he makes some statement where he says it's rigged and so on and so forth, but he can't fight it and and Biden's going to be the president, which then allows the GSA to, to ascertain the results and allows the rest of the GOP to sort of say, OK, Biden will be president going forward. Or, but I don't think that's in his nature to do. The other, the only other way this ends is that the results get certified, at which point the rest of the GOP has no choice mm -hmm. to recognize the results. They really can't stop anything. And that's the other striking thing to recognize that about what we've seen, as much as all the moves, you know, the sort of lawsuits, the the shenanigans, the, the Pentagon, all of that se seems somewhat disturbing. It's worth recognizing that none of this has stopped a single vote from being counted or a single vote result from being certified, and all of the all of those results show that Joe Biden won the election. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that more in the second half of the podcast when we're joined by Nicholas Grossman, who's got a great piece about how, uh, you know, the, the all of the attempts that uh, Donald Trump are making to overturn this election have so far failed. So let's talk about what happened yesterday. That really was quite extraordinary, where uh, it was early, was it felt early, um, yeah. where, where he said he won, but only because, and then people said, he's conceding, he's conceding, and then immediately, what did he do? Did he, he deleted the tweet and, and then, of course, went on a tear that... I'm not conceding anything. I so I have to admit this is this is where like I it was funny. I read that and I didn't I you know what I focused on right which is what I think I was you were supposed to focus on if you were the reader was Trump claiming that it was rigged. But it was clear that like a lot of media folks were primed to say he won. Okay, he won, so we get to like quote tweet him and say he won and so forth. And then you actually had real stories in Politico and the Times and and so forth claiming Trump acknowledges that that Biden won. And it, I have to admit, I think there was a small part of the media that really was trolling him at that point, mm -hmm. um, because there's no way to read that tweet than uh, otherwise than to say it was an illegitimate win. And it doesn't really count and so forth. But 
the very fact that he wrote the words he won gave me a carte blanche to sort of frame this. And it, by the way, it does demonstrate for all, I think it demonstrates a point that I think Ben Smith made in a column uh, pre-election that the media still has independent power, despite all these claims that Trump knows how to game the system. The, the very fact that they wrote that he won, which then causes Trump to just pitch a fit, um, where again, he really does sound like a four-year-old where his his minders are not taking him seriously, um, where he just gets more and more apoplectic. And indeed, like those, the tweets in response to it, you know, got further in all caps, further in all caps, further in all caps, um, shows the way in which, you know, when he tries to, to put a narrative out there and the media isn't buying it, he gets even more upset. It's a self-destructive cycle. So one of the things that I think you've been trying to do over the last four years, correct me if I'm wrong, is is to try to uh, not normalize Donald, Donald Trump, to kind of keep reminding us that we're dealing with this, this emotionally, psychologically immature figure. But this is really difficult because in, in 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 so many ways, even for those of us who keep saying don't normalize him, this is not normal. The fact that the president is tweeting out these bizarre, batshit, crazy conspiracy theories on an hourly basis is 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 still extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, the fact that he is talking about you know these you know Dominion, the the voting machines being hacked and you know being dominated by what Venezuelan communists. I mean. This is so insane. I mean, if you knew someone, if you ran into somebody at a bar talking like this, you would you would talk to the bartender. It's the president. And it, we are sort of at the stage of, well, yeah, that's Donald Trump. He's he's tweeting out bizarre, you know, you know, tinfoil hat conspiracy theories. But it is really amazing. And it's amazing how many people are willing to kind of like just kind of look, roll their eyes, look the other way or will actually believe this kind of shit. Yeah, so that's, I mean, and this in, in some ways is the fundamental question we're going to see over the next couple of months about how serious all of this is. Um, because I, I think actually the, the, the clip that so far defines the, the sort of fracture within the, the GOP, did you see that uh, clip of Lou Dobbs oh, interrogating God. Devin Nunez? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, for the readers who haven't, or for the listeners who haven't seen it, it it's an extraordinary moment because. Lou Dobbs clearly believes mm -hmm. that the election was stolen from Trump. I mean, he is honestly a true believer where he is. And because of that, he is outraged. He thinks Donald Trump won the election, that clearly there was some sort of, of election fraud going on. And he cannot understand and cannot comprehend why the GOP won't you know, do something about it. So he's interrogating Devin Nunez, someone who is generally thought of as being in Donald Trump's corner. And the look on Nunez's face while this is going on, Nunez looks honestly embarrassed because he, he's sort of caught in his, he's caught in what international relations scholars would call blowback, which is he's articulated this rhetoric, which now he has to actually act on. And he realizes that he has nothing. Um, and so he starts talking about going on parlor, uh, you know, as, a, as an alternative to Twitter. And Dobbs ain't having that because he's right. That doesn't mean anything. And really, Nunez has no answer for this. Because it's clear that Devin Nunez knows that the election wasn't rigged, that the election wasn't, you know, there was no electoral fraud, that, that Joe Biden actually won. But he wants to play this out for as long as he can, because he obviously wants the support of, of Trump's base. Um, and so, as you say, there, there's a large fraction, I think, of the institutional GOP, most of the, the GOP, which is frankly rolling their eyes at this. They don't think that, that Trump won the election. They're very happy they, you know, outperformed sure. expectations. And they're very happy to have Trump's base support them. Um, but they are not going to go out on a limb to, you know, overthrow uh, the law and, and, you know, in some extra legal fashion, uh, uh, keep Trump in power. The problem they have to deal with, though, and this is their own doing and they, this is their culpability, is that by playing along with Trump, they are giving, you know, oxygen to mm -hmm. folks like the Proud Boys, to the people who marched in the thousand mega march, not the million mega march, whatever you want to call it, in D.C. over the weekend. And do you know people who legitimately believe are on the on, on the are on the Lou Dobbs side um, of this divide? And I don't think it's I think the the number of Americans that actually belong in that category has been exaggerated somewhat. Um, you know the polling on this is ambiguous, but there's enough people so that if they're actually whipped into a frenzy, I I am somewhat concerned about you know the effects on civil peace, like for lack of a better way of putting it. 
Well, and the other thing that's going on right now, of course, is this uh, mad rush on uh, in, in the conservative media to, uh, to, to, to this mad rush to be the most Trumpist possible. Right. Trump uh, I, than now. I yeah. thought it was very interesting that you had the during the march on Saturday, the thousand person march or whatever that was uh, that they were chanting Fox News sucks. And so <laughs> there's this there's this sort of, you know, stepping to the stepping to the far right in deep, deeper into the fever swamps where the competition is, is Newsmax going to get this is. One America Network now going to get this. So it was a great piece of in Politico over the weekend, but the competition driving the far right MAGA echo chamber to cannibalize itself. And so there, there are people who are gravitating to Parler and One America News Network and and, uh, and and Newsmax and all of this stuff where they are willing to play around with these conspiracy theories, no matter you know what what's what's going on here. So I got to get your sense. You have a piece in The Washington Post today about what's going on in the Pentagon. Yeah. And this is the other big question that I have, which is how deeply to be alarmed by that. Uh, this was one of the first things that happened after he lost the election. He summarily fires the Secretary of Defense and then installs, I mean, you know, some some of the sketchy people that are being promoted there. So give me your take. This is something this is in this is in your wheelhouse. What's going yeah. on at the Pentagon and how and how worried should we be? So I think we should be somewhat worried, but we should not be worried about the sort of worst case scenarios that have been articulated. I mean, let, let's let's start with the obvious, which is the 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 most the most hyperbolic fear is that this is, you know, the machinations behind what would be a soft coup of some kind that he's trying to install loyalists at the Pentagon to make sure that, you know, if he conducts some extra legal play, he'll get backing from the military. And that's absurd. Um, you know, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mark Milley. Uh, has made clear repeatedly throughout the election that, and it's somewhat embarrassing that he even has to say this, but nonetheless he has, that the uniformed services are not going to get involved in any way whatsoever. Um, and the idea that that these folks who have just newly been in, you know, installed in civilian leadership, who are frankly way out of their depth, I mean, these are people who have been promoted three or four rungs above what their their previous pay grade was, and it wasn't like their previous pay grade, uh, they were performing you know really well. Um, they're not going to be able to to do anything like this. So that's not what's going on. Um, there are two other rival explanations for what's going on, and I think there's a grain of truth to both of them. Um, the first one, which I think Corey Shockey put the most elegantly in The Atlantic uh, last week, is that this is just basically spite. That um, you know Trump has been furious at Mark Esper, the, sec the former Secretary of Defense, ever since the summer when Esper publicly apologized and uh, you know about the military's role in the Lafayette Square debacle um, and expressly said that the Insurrection Act should not be invoked. Um, Trump has been itching to fire him ever since then. Post-election, now he has his chance and, and you know, he's been cleaning out house of, of Esper's acolytes uh, and subordinates as well as the DOD. Um, that's part of it. The other part of it, um, and you're, you've seen this in stories ranging from the Washington Examiner to the New Yorker, is that what Trump really wants to do is before uh, the end of his term, um, get all U.S. forces out of Afghanistan. That has been an express goal of the Trump administration, um, uh, taken into fruition uh, by a peace deal, which I am using air quotes on, um, but nonetheless with the Taliban that was initialed, um, I believe, a year ago or earlier this year. Um, and Esper and, and most of the DOD have resisted that. They don't want a, a pell-mell withdrawal, and they generally don't like the sort of idea of cutting and running. Um, and this is where... Things get tricky because, again, to be fair, Trump is the duly elected president. He will be the, the mm -hmm. president until January 20th. It is not absurd for Trump to want subordinates who actually carry out his lawfully uh, valid requests. And we've seen evidence, even in this past week or so, that Trump's foreign po policy subordinates occasionally will sabotage him. Um, mm -hmm. The State Department special envoy to Syria, Jim Jeffrey, acknowledged that they were basically playing shell games with the administration in terms of the amount of U.S. troops that were in Syria, that Trump thought there were 200, but there were probably more than 900, and that there was clearly willful obfuscation by folks like Jeffries. So, you know, it would not be surprising if the Defense Department was also sort of slow playing Trump's requests, and therefore um, part of the reason he's cleaning house is to try to affect a more rapid withdrawal from Afghanistan. But again, we get back to the, the macro problem with Trump, which is even if that is true, it's clear that there's been no planning done whatsoever 
um, by the Trump White House to actually manage to do this within the next 64 days, um, which is how much time Trump has left. Um, not to mention the fact that in addition to, I think there, I want to say there's roughly 4,000 U.S. troops currently in Afghanistan. There are also 10,000 plus NATO troops, um, other NATO troops in Afghanistan, um, which raises another awkward question. It's not like the U.S. military is going to be able to pull out and NATO is just going to stay there. And so um, it becomes an extremely awkward scenario, not to mention the fact that the Taliban is perfectly aware of all this. And therefore, they're taking advantage of it, which is they're not really adhering to the terms of the, of the peace deal. Um, and they're going to basically try mm -hmm. to put screws on, on U.S. forces and uh, U.S.-backed Afghan forces uh, for as long as possible. And so I think in some ways, my column was a very expanded edition of a tweet that uh, Lauren De uh, John Shulman, who's a, a former Obama administration Defense Department official, tweeted out, which is, I think, accurate, which is, on the one hand, it's valid for Trump to want... Um, subordinates who actually execute his orders. On the other hand, um, you you know you don't. There there are really bad ways to do this, and it looks like that's what Trump is doing. And third, and this is the most important and really problematic, trying to do this by changing personnel in midstream is a recipe for disaster. Um, not to mention that it's going to uh, potentially complicate the transition. Although this is, I do think there's one silver lining with that, which is. Oddly, by Trump trying to clean house right now, he creates a lot of very recent formers who now have carte blanche to talk to the Biden transition team if they still want to. Um, so in some ways, it, it, you know, again, the most infuriating thing and the one real aspect of Trump's tantrum that I think is problematic is the fact that the GSA had Emily Murphy right. refuse to ascertain the results for Biden, which means that um, essentially that that limits it, it blocks any of, of the cabinet departments from getting in contact with the Biden landing teams. And that really is, um, you know, shameful and just embarrassing. Well, and, and, and that has real tangible uh, consequences, including both, uh, you know, in the Department of you know, National Security issues, but also with the pandemic and uh, right. the distribution of the vaccine, which is going to be have to be handed off at some point. So let, let me circle back to the whole toddler in chief theme. Because a couple of things really strike me about watching his effect on, and, and I, I always sort of take my focus off of him and, and look at what he's doing to other people, uh, the way he's changed the the, the, the culture. Yeah. I mean, it, it used, a couple of people noted this over the weekend, that it used to be a fundamental part of American culture that we were that we didn't like sore losers. Yeah. Right. That, that, that you, that sportsmanship was important, uh, important, you know, every, after every, every, after every little league game, the teams lined up and they, they shook hands and did all of that. It's interesting the way so much of the right now is following his lead, morphing into thinking that whining is fighting and being a sore loser somehow is a form of manliness. And that, that's remarkable to me watching people who in any other context of their life, would be repelled by the whining, would be repelled by the sore losing and the complaining, and yet have decided that this is now the the political ideal they want to embrace. I mean, you don't have to look that far. Look at everything almost all these people said exactly four years ago. Exactly. Um, when, you know, Democrats, and by the way, Democrats didn't put up nearly the fight that, that you know, Trump has after the 2016 election. I mean, Clinton conceded the, you know, early in Wednesday morning after sure. election day. And, and, you know, despite a few challenges and in investigations, um, you know, the, there was a, an orderly transition. I mean, a, you know, Obama and Biden hosted Pence and, and Trump that week. Um, and, you know, you have all these officials from Kaylee McEnany to, you know, um, all the Fox News hosts basically complaining about Democrats whining to a much lesser extent than, than Republicans are doing right now. And now they, they talk about it as if this is a good thing. I agree with you. Um, which suggests a couple of things. First, th this is just pure partisanship. There's nothing else. Right. There's no underlying there's no principle. Right. Yeah. There's no underlying principle. But yes, it, it is disturbing that, you know, we've talked. I, I think I think it was Ezra Klein uh, who pointed this out five years ago. But it's true. If Trump has a political superpower, it's that he has no shame. Yeah. Um, and shame is a very powerful motivator in, in you know, human uh, behavior that, that, you know, People who don't, you know, don't want to be embarrassed will will avoid a whole variety of things. And it is disturbing to me to see the number of Republicans that have basically said, screw dignity, screw shame. I, you know, if it doesn't matter if I act like a toddler, because if I act like a toddler, I'm owning the libs somehow um, or I'm making life difficult for them that that 
Um, and if, if I do that, then that is somehow perceived of as a victory. Um, well, and a lot, and a lot of them do look at this election as kind of a validation of some of the bad behavior, right? It's like, okay, that apparently they will internalize that. Okay. It didn't work for Donald Trump, but you know, maybe, maybe this is, this is how I take the Trumpian mantle. This is really going to be interesting, actually. And I, I, I think this is the big question going forward because there's a, I don't th- I don't think the inter- I, that is one interpretation. I think it, it, it really does fall under the reasonable people can disagree in terms of, of trying to, to read the tea leaves on the election. The other way to look at it is that the GOP might actually be in trouble in some ways because they did well, but they did well mostly because the election brought out um, both the MAGA crowd, but also to some extent, you know, the sort of more traditional Republican crowd who were disgusted with Trump. But then voted Republican down ballot. Right. Um, and, and that's the only reason why, you know, again, it's worth stressing the, the congressional wing of the GOP outperformed Trump um, by and large. And so the question becomes and, and, and this has you know, been part of the anxiety, and I think justified anxiety about what we're going to see come 2024 and beyond, which is could you have a smarter, better version of Trump? Um, who, you know, wins election, but then actually really does engage in, in effective illiberalism as opposed to, you know, the more immature brand of illiberalism that, that Trump does. And this is where I'm honestly not sure, because there is a the counter argument to that is that Trump might be sui generis, which mm-hmm. is that he he simultaneously is illiberal. So that appeals to, to you know certain populists. There's no denying that. But the other reason that Trump does better is not really political. It's performative. Um, and you know, that, that, and, and we've seen this, you know, when you interview people at the MAGA rallies and, and so forth, that these are people that, that honestly don't care about policy one whit. They care about the Trump speeches and about him insulting people and about all of that. And this is where weirdly, I wonder whether any of the sort of Trump successors can replicate that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would kind of wonder, you know, Josh Hawley trying to pretend to be yeah. Donald Trump by, by throwing out the insults and stuff. It, 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 that's going to be very difficult for him to do that. It's going to be very right. difficult Cotton, for him to, yeah. Tom Mark Cotton. Pompeo, these are, you know, def- definitely Mike Pence, the, you know, Ted Cruz so, is trying. Right. None of these, Marco Rubio, like none of these, all of these folks are weirdly too establishment, even like folks like, you know, like just in terms of their upbringing to be able to do that. And I, you know, Don Trump Jr. I think is, is frankly going to be too coked out to do it. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I just, it's po- now that said, Trump himself might run in 2024. So, well, I wanted to ask you about that because you can tell right now that a lot of the Trump supporters and the fluffers are trying to sort of coax him out of the house. Like, hey, yeah. here's all the good things you can say about yourself. I, Hugh Hewitt's column is, is like <laughs> pure Hugh Hewitt wish casting. No, really, if you don't screw this up, if you come out and you're gracious, then you'll make the media elites look silly. And then you can you know, point to all these wonderful things you did. And then you get on with your life. It is sort of like, you know, come on down, uh, Ms., 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 Ms. Desmond. Uh, you know, the cameras are waiting for you. The lights are on. Uh, all of that. So do you think that he will? I mean, he has to go through this process. And at some point, maybe the best thing for him to do is say, I'm going to leave, but I'm coming back. Right. So he'll tell himself that. But do you think he really will run in 2024? That's a great question. So my bet, you know, is that what he winds up doing is spending most of January in Mar-a-Lago. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not like he's going to want to be in Washington. Uh, he likes Mar-a-Lago, you know, and, and it, by being out of the, of town, it avoids all of the awkwardness that will happen, you know, come inauguration day. That, by the way, was my favorite part of the of the Fox News coverage of the, of the MAGA march. Was that oh, um, I was going to correspondent saying, yeah, we can faintly hear the MAGA people, but mostly what we're hearing are the construction stands being erected for inauguration day. Oh. Um, or how about when he just drove through? When he yes, when he, 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 he was going to get yeah. him out like that. If there's anything that's like, come on, you know, go watch your fans, you know, that'll make you feel better. Right. I mean, I kept thinking about the um, the little thing he did at Walter Reed when uh, when he had the virus, you know, to, to right. drive out and wave to people um, in terms of him running in 2024. You know, my he's going to play that out for as long as possible. Right. Because mm-hmm. there's no downside for him to do that. Right. I exactly. mean, it, it, it keeps him as a potent political force. You know, it keeps his name in the press and so forth. That said, 
I, I can't help but feel he's going to wind up pulling a Sarah Palin um, and in the end crap out. Um, and by the way, one of the things that might happen, and this is really legitimately going to be the interesting question, is inevitably there are going to be people that want to run in 2024 if Trump doesn't. And the question is, how long do they hold their fire? Um, and at what point do they then actually get into the race? Um, and I assume there are going to be a few of them that, that you know, begin to... The question is, will, you know, will someone actually who you would associate someone as being relatively Trump friendly, nonetheless, get into the waters. Well, Mike Pence, for example, because I seriously doubt that Mike Pence is going to be the VP if Trump were to run again. Um, so Pence has to know that the only way he can he can have a future is if he were to actually to run. Yeah, that's true. I, I also wonder whether or not the, the various uh, grifts and media operations that the president, uh, that uh, Trump will you know try to get going, whether or not that might palinize him, you know, that at a yeah. certain point, you just, you sort of drift off into not, not just you become irrelevant, but you become kind of embarrassingly irrelevant. Um, I don't know who knows how he's, but, he, but you're right, he's going to play this out because this is how he stays relevant. This is how he right. still wields clout and intimidates people and gets his name in the news and gets on Fox and Friends. If he ever goes back to Fox and Friends, which I'm, I'm not sure, I, I, I think the idea of creating an alternative network is going to be incredibly appealing to him. Daniel Dresner, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Appreciate it very much. And of course, we'll continue following your toddler in chief tweets. I only have 64 more days of curation. I cannot wait until this ends. I'm not going to lie. All right. Thank, thanks a lot. I appreciate it very much. Thanks. So today we're going to be doing a two-part podcast because there's so much going on. We wanted to talk about uh, the toddler in chief, but we also wanted to break down what is going on with the election because, of course, we get lots of questions about how concerned we should be. And the piece that caught my eye over the weekend was uh, in Arc Digital by Nicholas Grossman, who wrote, Breaking Down Trump's Plan to Steal the Election and Why It Is Failing. And Nicholas Grossman joins us on the podcast. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome to the podcast. This is a first time. Uh, will will not be the last time, I'm hoping. Um, so I appreciate you joining us, uh, Nicholas. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, let's talk about this. Um, you had predicted uh, back during the summer that uh, what what uh, the, the step-by-step plan that you expected Trump to execute after the election, uh, seven point, uh, seven point uh, uh, Trump play, convince supporters COVID's not risky, cast doubts on mail-in voting, disrupt the Postal Service, get supporters to vote in person, lead on election night, declare victory on election night, and then disenfranchise, presumably Biden-leaning mail-in votes. And so here we're at. Here we are. A um, couple of weeks after the election, Trump and his allies spreading lies, conspiracy theories, false insinuations about voter fraud. And there are people who actually go on cable television talking about overturning an American election. So let's break down this plan and why you think it's failing. I've never seen anything like it. So I thought it was pretty surprising, but also pretty obvious that they'd been telegraphing it for months. Um, and we can see it playing out now with all of these efforts to try to get votes thrown out and with the effort to create a narrative of Trump voters coming in early, being counted early because they came in on election night. And then with states like Pennsylvania, uh, which Republicans successfully prevented from changing its vote counting rules to be more like Florida's and to be able to prepare the vote by mail to be counted on election night and get quick results. Instead, they started counting vote by mail the next day, which set up this narrative of, look, Trump was in the lead. And then somehow it was, I just saw a tweet yesterday, like magic, uh, that it was stolen from him. And like magic in this case was counting votes from Philadelphia or counting votes from Detroit. And the reason why we avoided what I think really could have been a chaotic situation was step five didn't work. Trump wasn't really leading on election night. For this plan to work, they needed the vote to be closer. They needed it to be a situation somewhat like 2000, where it all came down to one state, except it looked like in their case, the state they wanted it to come down to was Pennsylvania, as opposed to Florida, and then to try to fight it out. But when the Fox News called it for called Arizona uh, for Biden on election night, that threw off the whole narrative. And that also helps explain why they got so angry about that, because yeah. they didn't have this, we were winning, and then it was taken. Um, it started off right off the bat, 
Biden's doing pretty well and it looks like he might win. So what what they're left with is this very sort of elaborate Rube Goldberg theory that I'm hearing from Dan Patrick down in Texas and Victor Davis Hanson, who's you know talking to Seb Gorka about how Trump can still win. And it some goes something like, well, what we do is we overturn the election in Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada, and then <laughs> and then we get the Supreme Court to somehow invalidate Pennsylvania and overturn the election, which is that's a lot of moving pieces, isn't it? It's a lot. And that's why it's not working, that it's just too much. And there are too many votes. All of these states are Biden won by over 10,000 votes. In some cases, like Michigan, it's almost 150,000. So that's a lot of votes to get thrown out. That's not something like the 537 votes that decided the election in Florida in 2000. There's also no opportunity for the Supreme Court to step in. So they might have broken a tie for Trump in some way. Maybe, possibly, if this was all one state and Pennsylvania was taking a while to count and uh, Trump and his allies were making a lot of noise about it, maybe they could have gotten a court order to say, OK, hold on, let's wait for investigations to play out before we finish. Maybe, although I doubt it. But now there's no opportunity for the Supreme Court at all. There are just too many moving parts. And the conspiracy itself is too absurd. There's so many different people that would have had to have been involved. And I don't know about you, but uh, the Democratic Party is not an organization I would describe as hyper-competent super spies who are capable of organizing thousands of people in different places, places that are monitored by also hundreds of maybe thousands of people who have smartphones and getting this all the way. So the theory itself is ridiculous. And because of the ridiculous of it, ridiculousness of it, it's making it hard to catch on, but they're still doing it. And that's the part that I did not expect as much. I didn't think so much of the institutional Republican Party would get on board unless the election were actually close and there was a chance of this plan working. Yeah. I mean, just to remind people, Florida, in retrospect, is relatively simple compared to all of this. It's one state and the number of votes was very, very small, around a thousand or maybe below a thousand. We're now talking about multiple states with margins of 10,000, 20,000, which, you know, frankly, not that close. You know, in a state like Wisconsin, 20,000 votes is just not going to be overturned in a recount. There is going to be no recount. I almost break this down into several categories. There are people who say, look, I just want to recount. I just want to make sure that the votes are what they are which is, I suppose, defensible. And then, of course, you have the people who are willing to buy into the batshit crazy conspiracy theories about uh, the voting machines being changed. And, and, and my sense is that most of the establishment Republicans just are, are kind, of, kind of waiting out Trump's tantrum. You know, that, that they don't believe this. The very few of them actually believe that it's going to be overturned. Lou Dobbs thinks it's going to be overturned. Maybe Victor Davis Hanson thinks it's going to be overturned. I don't get a sense that most people think it's going to happen. No, I think most of them are just saying it, that either they're humoring him or they're afraid of mean tweets or they want his help riling up voters so that they can stand a better chance in the Georgia Senate runoffs or any of those other possibilities, you know, fundraising. Um, and the big problem, though, is you have these cynical leaders um, who are doing this out of you know either craven opportunism or a sort of cynical political ploy or, you know, maybe just cowardice. And... The people, though, who they're telling it to don't yeah. all realize that it's fiction. That's that right. At least some of them are taking this seriously and are going to believe for probably the indefinite future, you know, for many years uh, that there was an illegitimate election in America. And that is going to be a ongoing problem for public legitimacy. I'm not sure what to do about that, but I would really like leaders to display a little more patriotism and care more about American democracy than about either a long shot or I would hope. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I hesitate to quote John Bolton because I'm not a fan, but, you know, he was saying that it is incumbent on Republican leaders to explain to their base, their constituencies, that this was not a stolen election. It has to come from them. I was actually thinking about this over the weekend. You know, there were protests in places like Wisconsin that, that did not go well. Um, nobody's going to overturn Wisconsin's election, by the way. And I was thinking, what would it take to actually make people believe in the democratic process again, the integrity of the elections? And it would take someone like, 
you know, a former Governor Scott Walker standing up and saying, okay, guys, uh, we don't like it. Um, we wanted Trump to win, uh, but he didn't win. This is the way elections are. When he was defeated two years ago, he didn't ask for a recount. So it would take someone like that to stand up in the face of the conspiracy theorists and the sore losers and everything. But you're not seeing that. Nobody has the courage to do that. This is almost, it really does strike me, Nicholas. I know it's almost like a cliche of, of a test of putting country over party. I mean, isn't this like the purest form in the middle of the pandemic? This is about the integrity of our democracy. This is easy because it's not that close an election. It's the right thing to do to acknowledge the defeat, the necessity of having faith in the system, the importance of peaceful transfer of power. There's a national emergency that's costing human lives. So this would be like the perfect example of when you should put country over party and so that's, I think that's what's so disillusioning and painful about this is that we're not seeing that. I feel the same way. And I agree that this is about as big an example I can imagine of an opportunity to put country over party. I might have previously answered the impeachment because um, I thought the case, like uh, Mitt Romney explained it, was a clear constitutional violation and an op- uh, Trump was attempting to corrupt an election, which, is, as Romney said, was uh, the about the worst violation of an oath of office that he could imagine. Um, but I can understand a case of why people would say we should leave this up to the voters or, uh, you know, we're not going to we don't think this is necessarily a removable offense, even if we do have an issue with it or any other arguments like that I could accept. Um, but this is the single most important democratic institution in the entire country. It's elections are a unavoidable key feature of democracy and the result is not ambiguous. So it would be time for people to put country over party in a very simple sense and just acknowledge reality. Really, all all that we're asking them to do is acknowledge reality, which really should not be hard. No, it, it, it should not be. And in real time, as you as you point out, I mean, this legal strategy is collapsing. I mean, they file all these lawsuits in five of the crucial states. And obviously, the, the attempt was to reveal fraud and dysfunction. In fact, uh, it's done pretty much the opposite, right? I mean, it's kind of a refer, uh, it's affirmed the integrity of this election. Almost every single lawsuit has been thrown out. And, and some of them, it's been comic how weak they are. And as far as I can tell, not, hardly a single vote has been overturned, right? And then, then you had the letter of 16 federal prosecutors um, did something that's really quite remarkable. They write a letter to, to uh, Attorney General Barr telling him there was no evidence of fraud, no evidence of other irregularities. Like, so that theory is gone. And in Pennsylvania, they've abandoned one of their key claims, you know, trying to get 600 or 700,000 votes thrown out. Uh, so this this is this is not working out. And the one thing which is amazing to me, the part of the Hail Mary, the the loose talk about having uh, legislators essentially declare the election null and void and put in place their own electors. That also is just absolutely going nowhere. I mean, Repu- even Republican leaders are you know, in places like Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin are going, yeah, we're not going to be doing that. So, I mean, it's so. So what is it about? What What is what is Trump's besides just dealing with his own you know psychological bizarre needs what what is what is the point of of continuing to throw this uh the shit up against the wall it's a con it's a way to keep people angry and to extract money from supporters and you can tell this in a couple of ways uh one is the lawsuits that they're filing aren't even alleging in court the voter fraud that Trump is claiming publicly. So it's not even that their cases are failing, not even that they've withdrawn some lawsuits because the evidence is so sparse, but because they haven't even tried to make this case in court. So that's how you know they don't really believe it. The lawsuits, this makes me think of when Trump would use the legal system when he was in business, which was not necessarily to win the case. It was to create leverage, to be a pain, to make people take time and spend resources. You know, this was a common thing he would do where he would stiff contractors and then say, you know, basically, okay, fine, take me to court. And then they would, legal fees would pile up and then they would cut a deal or maybe they would just let it go. Um, And so that's one aspect of it. And the other one that it makes me think of is the uh, attempted play with Ukraine in which uh, Trump tried to pressure Ukraine's President Zelensky to announce an investigation into the Bidens, not necessarily conduct one, but to announce one. And so it's more of a informational strategy than a legal strategy. It's to create this pretext to be able to say, 
all these lawsuits are in court, the outcome is uncertain, not necessarily to win the lawsuits. Maybe if the election were really close, they could have had an actual legal strategy that maybe would have stopped the count somewhere, such as Pennsylvania. But Without that, they're not really trying to win in court. What they are doing is sending out a bunch of fundraising texts and emails telling people that the election is being stolen, that you need to uh, give money to uh, fight against this. And, uh, you know, of course, not putting forward evidence, but that you need to fight against it. And then Reuters reported that the first 8,000 that anybody donates to this, uh, quote, stop the steal, uh, unquote, fund. Um, isn't actually going to any sort of legal strategy. It's going to Trump's uh, super PAC that he is just starting and to the Republican National Committee. So they are telling people it's for stealing, they're taking money, and then they're using it for other things. Yeah. Okay. So I, what I've tried to say to people is take a deep breath. This is not going to overturn the election. Joe Biden's going to be sworn in. But that's not to minimize the damage that this causes. Because as you point out, I think there are going to be millions of people who will go to their deathbeds believing that this was stolen. It will be the stab in the back and it will poison American politics going forward for really for, you know, for the rest of our lifetime. Um, from Trump's point of view, he's willing to do that because that establishes his brand, not as a loser, but as somebody who was cheated. He could use this as perhaps a slingshot to run again in 2024. But again, and I feel like we've asked this question 10,000 times, can you explain to me why so few other elected Republicans are willing to push back against this? I mean, has it, I understand that the cynicism and there's the Georgia election coming up, but you know, the, the long-term damage to our constitutional system is so fundamental. And this is a political party that will tell you the most important thing they have is defending the Constitution, right? That's the whole point of the federal judges. And, and yet, they're willing to look the other way, knowing that this damage is taking place in real time. I don't have a good answer for yeah. that. I, I, I wish I did. Uh, the, the best I can come up with is they believe that defending the constitution or whatever, defending a particular vision of America that they have requires Republican power, that um, Democrats are somehow un-American or doing un-American things. It's almost the flight 93 election mentality that the yeah. it's worth trying to crash the government into Pennsylvania if that will possibly maybe allow you to hang on to it for a little longer, um, you know, even give you a chance because the alternative is such disaster. Um, and I don't personally think there's anything about a Biden administration that would make me say, oh, no, that's a you know anti-American disaster. Um, but that's the best I could justify no, it as. I, um, and I think a lot of it is personal, meaning that there are social pressure um, there. If everyone around you believes a particular narrative and you challenge it, it would get exhausting. People wouldn't like you pointing it out to them. And all the media that they consume is saying it. I find it very hard to draw, without talking to anybody um, in person, to draw the distinction between actually believes it, doesn't believe it at all, but is just saying it, or something kind of in the middle. I think it's very difficult for any human being to constantly argue something and not convince themselves at least a little. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this question because I look at people and go, okay, do you really believe this or is this just something that you're saying because it is tactically or strategically important? Or have you really lost kind of the ability or the willingness to make that distinction. At a certain point, when you're sort of in the rush of battle, you're just going to grab whatever cudgel is available and you don't sit down and think, do, do I really want to do this? Am I am I right? I don't, I really don't know how many of the true believers, I mean, Lou Dobbs is a true believer. I would, I would get that. I think there are other people who are just in the just asking questions category, right? But you know what's interesting? Uh, the, the number of people who have somehow internalized the idea that having a majority on the Supreme Court was going to be the ultimate trump card for them, that they really were kind of thinking that, you know, you know there, there's, it was going to be messy. And then the Supreme Court was going to hand the election to, to Donald Trump. The number of times that comes up is amazing. I was watching this uh, YouTube video of uh, Victor Davis Hanson. I mentioned him a couple of times. He's talking with Seb Gork and he goes to this elaborate thing where he then gets to, and then Pennsylvania, the Supreme Court would have to weigh in and would, you know, have, we'd have to figure out whether the Supreme Court would want to take the heat to overturn an election. So he's using the phrase overturn an election, actually getting to the point where here we have this party that claims to be all about uh, the integrity. I mean, you know, what, what's the whole point about uh, being concerned about voter fraud? Because you're really obsessed about voter integrity, right? And yet here we are, 
where you have a substantial portion of the Republican Party that claim to be about voter integrity, basing their hopes on two things, massive disenfranchisement. I mean, massive, hundreds of thousands of people's votes being thrown out and then having the Supreme Court activist judges coming in and overturning an election. I mean, that's kind of a wow moment, isn't it? It is that after even after all these four years, it's still um, maybe not surprising. You know, I did lay this out over the summer, uh, but and I think, you know, they were telegraphing it pretty clearly. Um, not surprising, but still shocking that it's important to remember that it is shocking, that it is uh, anti-democratic, that it's unlike something that I've ever seen in my life or ever expected to see in the United States in my life. Um, and yet they're doing it. And uh, it's clear, at least I think as a saving grace, that the judiciary does not seem interested in stepping into this, that they've been throwing out cases. There was uh, the one in Pennsylvania, for example, um, that uh, the biggest case that they were trying to say something about uh, improper counting because they weren't given the Trump campaign, wasn't given uh, enough observation uh, of the vote counting. Um, and first, a district court shot it down. And then on appeal, a circuit court uh, which is dominated by conservative justices uh, appointed by Reagan and Bush, also shot it down pretty uh, pretty clearly and pretty quickly. Um, and so the Supreme Court also doesn't seem really interested in stepping in. But even hearing prominent people talk about it, talk about the Supreme Court doing something like that is quite unsettling. And that's the important difference between this and 2016. You had, you know, Democrats, uh, maybe some media figures talking about things like faithless electors or, um, you know, won't somebody go and, and vote against Trump there? Can't we still get it? And that strikes me more as people who are unhappy about an election result and processing it. So if like, you know, random people on Twitter were like, someone should uh, be a faithless elector for Trump, you know, I think that is fairly normal. It's well, that's, that, leadership that's doing it. That's weird. Well, exactly. And that's an important and then that's obviously an important distinction as well. Right. I mean, whether you're talking about some random people on Twitter, the one guy whose name I'm now forgetting on, on cable television who was suggesting it, that's very different from Hillary Clinton and the leadership of the Democratic Party embracing it. This is coming from the president of the United States. And and the, and the fact that some of the stuff that he's putting out there, I, I just I this whole thing about dominion, um, which is has been debunked so many different times. Apparently, it came from some anonymous guy on the internet, and it, it strikes me as that in, in 2016 we were all worried about Russian disinformation and what we, what we don't need Russian disinformation. We don't need Vladimir Putin. the 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 biggest vector of disinformation in this country right now is the president of the United States, which is really quite a, an amazing moment here. So, uh, in the at the end of the day. Um, this is not going to work. I, I know there were people thinking, well, you know, is, 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 is it possible that he's going to be able to pull, pull this off? I don't think it would require, um, it would require, I mean, when you think about what actually would have to happen, including legislatures overturning the, the votes of their own constituents, not going to happen. The U.S. Supreme Court disenfranchising the voters of the state of Pennsylvania I, and maybe I'm, I'm insufficient. I, maybe I'm insufficiently cynical, but I don't see that happening. Um, but 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 I do think that you're right. This is this is a marketing ploy for Trump, and I d don't necessarily think it will fail from his point of view. I'm not worried about it working either. And uh, this is for someone for me, just the, the background for this of uh, I teach national security and I have kind of a national security brain, um, especially about uh, terrorism, which is my main area of study. And uh, we focus on things called uh, low probability, high impact events. There's like Dick Cheney's 1% doctrine was one mm -hmm. articulation of it, that right. things that are, uh, they might be unlikely, but they are so impactful, they'd make, be such a big deal that we should worry about them anyway. And so I was worrying about things like maybe Russian hackers uh, trying to mess with voter rolls in advance of the election, um, or widespread voter intimidation, or other things like that, which might not have been especially likely. And even though I have this national security brain, I am not worried about this election somehow being overturned. There's just too many moving parts, uh, too many people who would have to somehow get in line behind it. So that part I'm not worried about. But um, I don't think it's necessarily a failure from Trump's perspective. And that's because it's kind of like his bankruptcy play. Something that a lot of people seem to misunderstand about Trump is think that he's good at winning. And while you know he wins sometimes, he loses sometimes, what he's really good at and has been throughout his career is making sure that when he loses, the brunt of the loss falls on others. 
um, like when he managed to screw over his partners with the Trump Taj Mahal bankruptcy, that um, he cashed out and made sure they got uh, all the pain of the loss. Um, and so right now, the people that are getting the pain of the loss is the United States of America. Um, and he is managing to cash out. Well, he'll be set up pretty well to have still a chunk of followers, probably quite a bit of influence in the Republican Party, and an income stream from people who think that they are standing up to some conspiracy by funding his legal fees that aren't actually going to his legal fees. Excellent analysis. Thank you for joining me, Nicholas Grossman. You can read his piece, Breaking Down Trump's Plan to Steal the Election, Why It is Failing, Undermining Democratic Legitimacy and Conning Supporters, but Not Actually Affecting Results. I think that's exactly right. Nicholas Grossman, thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we will do this all over again.